Hello, and welcome to the first video lecture of many for Math 244, Introduction to Differential Equations. My name is Matt Charlie, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course this summer. If you're watching this before the first day of class, thank you very much for getting on top of things and watching it beforehand. If you're watching it afterwards, thanks for going back to take a look at it. Um, this first video is basically part of what I'm going to be covering in the first lecture on the first day of class, but it's here for the sake of being in a video anyway. And what I'm going to be talking about in this video is why you, as engineers or physicists, should care about this class. Um, since it is a math class, you, it's most for you, it's required for your major, but why should you actually care about this class? And the main reason for that is the fact that ODs show up in a lot of different places and are very common in mathematical models for physical situations. So if you want to model some sort of situation mathematically, some sort of physical situation, you'll want to use a differential equation to do so. And being able to solve differential equations will give you a way to either analyze how the solution is going to play out if you know what the setup is, or determine how you want to set up your system to make it behave in a certain way. If you know how, if you know that it's going to follow some differential equation as it progresses in time, let's take a look at a couple examples of what I'm talking about to sort of see what I mean by this. So the first example that we're going to look at is that of a falling object. So what I mean by this is we have some object that is just falling under the force of gravity, but is also acted on in resistance to that by a drag force that acts proportional to the velocity. Now we know by Newton's law, basically, that force is mass of acceleration, and acceleration is change in velocity. So what I can do is I can write an equation for the change in velocity or the acceleration in terms of these two factors. So I get something that looks like this. We're here I'm using velocity to mean velocity in the downward direction. So what the equation says there is that mass times acceleration, which is Newton's law, equals the net force on the system, which is the gravitational force pulling down minus this drag term that acts in the upward direction, canceling out this velocity. So what we can do with this is we can plug this into something like maple, which is a numerical solver, and see what we get out of that. And so this is a setup here that does this exact thing in maple. So you've got set up a mass, a drag coefficient, and the force of gravity, and you set up this differential equation. You'll see how to do this in a couple weeks when we start doing maple stuff in class as well. And you can just plot it. And what you see is, depending on the initial velocity you start with, you get a different solution. So if it starts moving downward at 8 meters per second, it looks like this. And so you see you're getting towards this sort of terminal velocity, which you'd expect, which is where the forces balance out. So if I start at about 8, I get a curve that looks like this. If I start a lot slower, like say down at 1, I still approach the same velocity, but it takes me longer to get there because I started below. What the equation also tells us if we start above, say at 15, we'll slow down until we hit the terminal velocity as well. So what this sort of direction field, this is the green arrows here, and the differential equation tell us is how the velocity is going to change over time. And it tells us that in absence of any other forces, it's going to, appro it's going to approach the terminal velocity of the system, which you could calculate from the equation there. And we will do that in a couple days. Another example of this that does a good way of illustrating why these equations could be useful is the idea of a mass on a spring. The idea of this system is that you have a mass that dangles from a spring and you basically let it hang there as it would from the spring and you move it somewhere and let it go and the spring will sort of pull it back up and start bouncing up and down. And now we're assuming that gravity doesn't play a role here just because it's going to get in the way of all of our other stuff, but so the spring's moving sideways but I just drew vertically because it's easier to draw that way. Now, what kind of forces do we have going on? Well, we have our net force, which is going to be our acceleration, which is then going to show up as a double prime because we're using u as the position, not the velocity. And what acts on it? Well, there are two things that act on this case. There is a spring constant, which is to, which determines is how much the spring is going to pull back on the object or push away, depending on far distance equilibrium. And that, using Hooke's law, is just a constant times the position assuming that zero is the resting point. And there's also some sort of damping coefficient, which is similar to the drag in that it just resists motion. And it's gonna sort of be how, these, how the system loses energy is when the drag coefficient shows up and starts taking away energy from the system. So if we write all that out, we get something that looks like this. Where K is our Hooke's law constant and gamma is our damping coefficient from before. So we can do the same thing with this and put this into maple and see what that gives us. We get in here, and I just picked numbers for the um, 
the spring constant dynamic coefficient. It doesn't matter what they are, I just pick them for right now. And we do the same thing, we can set up a differential equation and try to solve it. Now, what we see here is we see what happens is you let the spring go, the mass starts two units away, and sort of oscillates itself back to rest in the center. If I reduce the dynamic coefficient to zero, you'd expect that if there's no damping, it just oscillates the same way forever because it's not going to lose any energy. But if something else happens, if I increase the dynamic coefficient even higher, if I make it say two, I don't get oscillation at all. It basically just goes straight to zero and doesn't oscillate at all. And this is what we call, uh, this is sort of a bifurcation, it's the other word here, where the solution changes form as you change the dynamic coefficient. So a lot of work you can do in ODEs is to determine what is this damping coefficient that makes this happen and in a certain system maybe you want it to be over damped like this where you don't get any oscillation and you know how hard you have to make your spring in order to make this work and to satisfy this sort of formula so ODs gives us a way to analyze this and figure out how we want to set things up if we want things to work in certain ways so a couple more examples of equations that we can look at that are useful and this one here we're going to talk about is population dynamics now this overall is a really, really crude model of population, but it'll work for a starting point. So let's say you've got a population of rabbits in a field and they breed like rabbits, which in terms of differential equations is gonna tell us that the change in the population of rabbits over time is gonna look like some rate times the population itself. So it's gonna be, it's going to grow proportional to how many there are, more rabbits, you breed more rabbits, the population gets bigger that way. Now, in addition to this, let's also assume that there are like hawks or birds in the area that are going to consume, eat a certain number of rabbits as time goes on. So we're going to have an amount of the rabbits that also get killed by a flat amount in terms of these pred the predation rate. So we'll put a, we'll put a C here, why not? to refer to our predation rate. So that is how fast or how, how quickly the rabbits get consumed over time. So we can look at this guy as well in Maple and see what he does. And that looks something like this. So here we've got the same thing. As you can see the equation here looks like a rate, this 0.1 is our R times the population and then a minus 200 factor. And we can solve it again. And what we see here looks substantially different than what we saw in the first problem, right? So in the first problem, all solutions sort of converged towards a middle point, towards a terminal velocity, where in this case, they're all running away. So if I start at 2,500, my solution takes off upward like this. If I start at 1,500, my solution tanks off, drops, and goes to zero. If I even start lower, so I start too low, like 1,000, it crashed to zero before I even get to 10 time steps away. So this here is what we would call an unstable equilibrium point, where there's a point in the middle, say at 2000, where it just is constant, nothing changes. There's the amount being born the same as not being killed, so it doesn't go anywhere. But if you start anywhere away from that, you start diving away further as time goes on. So this is an unstable equilibrium point where the first one where everything converged towards that middle point would be a stable equilibrium point. And stuff in ODs can tell you whether things are stable or unstable. And this would be important to know when you're trying to set up a problem. If you want to go towards an equilibrium point, it better be stable. If it's unstable, you're gonna go run, run away from it. It's not something you want to do. Now, let's say you didn't think this was good enough. This population model wasn't good enough. And you wanna say, well, what about the population of the birds that are eating the rabbits? How does that change in time? And what if that changing can affect how the rabbit population changes? Well, there's another model for that and that will fall under predator-prey models. And I wrote two names there, Lotka Volterra, because that's the name associated to this general model. So the idea of that model is the following. You have the rabbits, so I'm going I'm to switch to rabbits are X and the birds of prey, the birds that are eating them are Y. So you have the rabbits, and their population would grow at a normal rate if there were no predators. But then they get eaten at a certain rate as well. So their population drops by a factor of, say, alpha as a factor, by how many times the two of them interact. So this becomes a minus alpha X Y.
Whereas on the other hand, the birds of prey will die off at a certain rate because they have no food if there are no uh, prey to eat. So that's a minus d y. And then they will grow in population by eating the prey. So they get a plus beta x y, where this beta corresponds to the sort of conversion factor of the energy from the prey into new offspring on the predator side. So yet again, you can throw this into maple in a numerical solver and see what happens. And that's this last set here. So I've picked some values for the parameters up here. Not really important to worry about that. And I can draw a vector field plot here. Now you can also animate this. So the idea is we're going to start, this is just the vector field and the direction field. If you're at any one of these points, the arrow will tell you which way you're going to go from there. Now, if I go here, I can run this and it'll start from a certain point and it'll trace out sort of a path of what happens. So you can see that over time, the predator prey cycle follows a loop like that as time goes on. So if it starts there, there are what low predators and high prey. So it's going to shoot up, but then as it grows, the predator population can grow in response. And then when the predator population gets too big, it eats more of the prey and you sort of get this oscillation factor. And what you see here is you actually do get cycles where they actually do go in a cyclic pattern back and forth, back and forth as, as time goes on. And that's something you can also get out of this um, differential equations system, and you can get it out of the class as well. So this sort of setup where you've got two equations is called the system of differential equations. And by analyzing them together, you can get the sort of behavior going on and see what's actually happening in the system as time goes on. So there's a couple of examples of, of models that can be used in differential equations to do to take care of physical systems, which should show you why it's important to sort of have the ideas from this class as you move on to engineering physics type applications. Um, now in this case, we will also be solving things explicitly, and there's an important reason for that as well. So the qualitative behavior, let me switch back to the maper real quick. The qualitative behavior, like those, the vector fields you see, will tell you sort of what's going to happen over time, right? We could see that the one thing was unstable, the other equilibrium point was stable, and that sort of thing. What it doesn't tell you is how fast you're going to get there. And that's where actually solving the equations come in. Whether that comes from solving it directly analytically by hand and getting actual formula for the answer, or throwing into something like maple to get answers that way, solving the solution out like that will tell you how fast you're going to converge to something. So both of those things, what's going to happen and how fast it's going to happen are both very important in engineering physics applications. And that's why you should really care about learning what I have to say in this class. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll look forward to you watching the next video.